Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 4, verse 18, all the way through the entirety of chapter 5. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 18, all the way through the end of chapter 5. If you have your Bibles with you, please follow along. If not, you can follow along on the screen beside me. Receive now God's word. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love, in a spirit of gentleness? It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reveler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. This morning we are entering into a new section in the letter of 1 Corinthians. It starts in chapter 4, verse 18, and covers all of chapter 5 and all of chapter 6. Anthony Thistleton, a New Testament scholar, aptly titles this entire section, Moral Issues Which Demand a Clear-Cut Verdict. Moral Issues Which Demand a Clear-Cut Verdict. If you simply glance through the headers of each of the passages in these chapters, I think you will see why he chose that title. To be precise, there are three moral issues that compose this broader section. First, there is the issue of incest. Then in chapter 6, there is the issue of lawsuits. And thirdly, there is the issue of prostitution. Today, as well as next week, we'll be taking a look at the first of those three issues, and I think from the scripture reading alone, you will have been able to identify Paul's objective in this first issue. Follow along with me in your Bibles. Verse 2, Paul writes, Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Verse 5, You are to deliver this man to Satan. Verse 7, Cleanse out the old leaven. Verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Verse 11, but now I am writing to you not even to eat with such a one. And last but not least, verse 13, purge the evil person from among you. It is very clear, right, what Paul would have the Corinthians do. He would have them kick this man out of the church. To put it more technically, he is calling for excommunication. And immediately, we can hear the objections. 
How dare Paul do such a thing? Is that even an option? Can we as the church exclude people from our fellowship? How archaic, how unchristlike, how unloving, how judgmental, how intolerant. I would imagine that this was in part the position of the Corinthians themselves because otherwise they would have already kicked this man out. But the fact that he remains and the fact that Paul has to be the one to bring this up indicates that the Corinthians were in favor of a more tolerant stance. And yet, while we say to Paul, how could he be so intolerant? Paul says to the Corinthians, how can you be so tolerant? In other words, when it comes to dealing with sin, most churches today share more in common with the Corinthians than they do with the Apostle Paul. I think it'll be helpful for us if from the beginning we remind ourselves of Paul's ultimate goal in writing not just this section, but this entire letter. Turn your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And take a look at verse 18. This is near the end of the section. And here Paul issues a command that can be understood as a type of summary of the entire unit. Paul writes, flee from sexual immorality. That's what Paul is concerned about, that this church flees sexual immorality. We then find the positive counterpart to that command just two verses later in verse 20. There Paul writes, so glorify God in your body. So negatively, flee immorality. Positively, glorify God. Now turn your Bibles back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Very first chapter, verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was quite a while ago, but in that verse, if you remember, Paul alludes to Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, in which the prophet envisions that the worship of the one true God will one day arise in every place, and my name, says the Lord, will be great among the nations. For Paul, the New Testament church was the beginning fulfillment of Malachi's hope. And the Corinthians are therefore part of God's redemptive plan to have his name be glorified among the nations in every place, starting with the city of Corinth. But you see, in order for that to happen, and in order for that to happen through the church, it is absolutely imperative that the church be holy. It is absolutely imperative that the church be pure. And it is therefore absolutely imperative that those who defile the church be removed. So let me summarize that like this. Paul's immediate concern is to have this incestuous man removed. Paul's penultimate concern is that this church flees sexual immorality. And Paul's ultimate concern is that the name of the Lord is glorified. We ought to bear that in mind as we go through this section. We're not really going to get very far in this larger passage this morning. We actually won't make it past verse 2 of chapter 5. And so I have just two headings for you today. Number one, Paul's warning. Number two, Paul's outrage. I think this will probably be the first of either two or three part sermon. And so in order for you to really understand Paul's stance on sexual immorality and Paul's position on excommunication, you will have to take into consideration the entirety of the passage. But before we get into the text, let's pray one more time. O gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne precisely because you are gracious and you show mercy to us. You showed us mercy on the cross when in Christ Jesus our sins were forgiven and you show us mercy each and every day for in spite of being saved by your son, we still sin and we still have tendencies that displease you. We thank you for being merciful. 
And at the same time, we thank you for being a father who cares enough to discipline us. And so as we take a look at this passage about discipline, help us to submit to this word. Help us submit to your church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 4, verse 18. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, or will, or with love, in a spirit of gentleness? As you can see for yourself in your Bibles, this passage is included as part of the previous discussion in chapter 4. However, I think it rightfully belongs with the following discussion for several reasons, of which I'd like to point out just one for the, for the sake of time. You may have noticed, but this passage contains several ideas which are repeated in chapter 2. Again, take a look at your Bibles. In verses 18 and 19, Paul brings up the issue of arrogance. And now turn your Bibles to chapter 2, 5, verse 2. Paul says, and you are arrogant. Back in chapter 4, this time, verses 19 and 20, Paul mentions this idea of power. Chapter 5, verse 4, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord with the power of our Lord Jesus. And last but not least, all of verses 18 through 21 is really about Paul's coming or his presence. And in chapter 5, verse 3, Paul will allude to this again. For though I am absent in body, I am present in spirit. Now, when we recognize this, it becomes evident that these verses function as a type of warning. Paul is giving a fair warning to this church before he launches into a series of rather heavy topics that require drastic measures. Some are arrogant, Paul says, as though I were not coming to you. Seems like there were some people in Corinth who were willing to openly challenge and undermine Paul's authority because they found a sense of security in their belief that they'd never see him again. We don't get a very good picture of who these people were, at least not in this letter, but I think we are provided with some further clues once we fast forward a couple months and we take a look at 2 Corinthians. But that is a discussion for another time. Whoever they were, this is probably the last thing that they wanted to hear. But I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. Now, throughout his letters, Paul consistently qualifies his travel plans as being conditioned by God's will. That is not him being elusive, but simply humble before God, recognizing that he can't predict what will happen next. But when he manages to come, it'll be for the purpose of investigation and correction. What he wants to know is, are the Corinthians living out their faith. I will find out, not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. That contrast between talk and power may sound a little bit strange at first, but it is actually quite simple. Talk refers to their speech. It is likely that these arrogant people had gained a foothold amongst the Corinthians because of their persuasive speech. As we've already seen, this church was all too easily impressed by man's pedigree, his commendations, and especially his rhetorical skills. In contrast, power refers to the effectiveness of that speech, not just to tickle your ears, but to bring about a concrete change in your life. So what Paul is saying is this, I don't really care how eloquent these people are, what I'm more concerned about is whether or not their words are translating into right action. Of course, Paul says that, knowing that since his departure, the Corinthians have taken a turn for the worse. So he suspects that something is not right, and he's going to find out when he comes. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. The point is... In Christ's kingdom, how impressive you sound doesn't really matter. What counts is that you are living out your faith. This is why when, when Paul first came to Corinth, he was determined not to proclaim the gospel with lofty speech, as he said earlier in chapter 2, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of 
power. That is, the power of God to transform lives. In verse 21 now, Paul offers the Corinthians a choice. He puts the ball in their court. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? The options are straightforward. Do nothing, meaning do nothing in response to the instructions that Paul's about to give, or obey. So put away this incestuous man, stop taking their brothers to court, and stop visiting prostitutes. If they opt to do nothing, then Paul will have to come with a rod. This rod is the same rod that is mentioned in the book of Proverbs. For example, in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Or Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13, I like this one, do not withhold discipline from a child if you strike him with a rod, he will not die. That's funny because Solomon has a somewhat cavalier attitude about something that's considered politically incorrect in today's culture. How can you even think about striking your child? Solomon says, well, it's not like he's going to die. What's the worst that can happen? There's some biblical warrant for you to strike your child if necessary, if for the purpose of discipline. Solomon continues, if you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. We'll get to this when we get to it, but I want you to notice just for now the parallel between Solomon's comment and Paul's comment back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. You are to deliver this man to Satan so that his spirit may be saved. You see, Paul's learned from the wise man himself. His method is thoroughly Old Testament, and I'll be pointing out a couple of other instances in this larger passage where he is quite clearly dependent upon scriptural precedence. So the rod that Paul mentions is the rod of discipline. Obviously, that's not to say that he's going to give the Corinthians a spanking, but that is to say that he will enact some form of strict and even painful discipline. That is not, however, his preferred choice. He'd rather them obey so that he can come with love in a spirit of gentleness. How do we know that that's his preferred method? Well, because he gives this warning in the first place. To state the obvious, this is a letter. Not only does it take time for it to reach the Corinthians, but it will take even more time for Paul himself to go to Corinth. He provides an estimate even in the very last chapter of this letter. Paul informs them, I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. For the Corinthians, this is time to reflect. This is time to repent. And this is time for them to get their act together. And this is why I've titled this first point, A Fair Warning. As stern as Paul is going to be in the following chapters, we have to place that severity within the context of this warning. Paul is an incredibly fair man, and he cannot be accused of being brash. The same has to apply to us. Excommunication cannot be the preferred method of discipline. As a church, we would rather discipline our members with love in a spirit of gentleness. Paul's instructions elsewhere bear this out. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently, enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. It is only if your brother in sin has rejected and despised your gentleness, it is only after your patient endurance of his evil is exhausted that a stricter, more severe form of discipline can ensue. To put that differently, there has to be a period of warning that precedes the rod. There must be a period of warning that precedes the rod. Mention of the rod 
once again evokes the parental relationship that Paul has with this church. So I want you to think with me. Who would object to the notion that parents have to discipline their children? No one. No one would object to that. There is, however, a difference between discipline that is fair and discipline that is unfair. If a child does something wrong, and the parent, without ever explaining what he did wrong, explodes in anger, grabs the child by the arm, and beats him with a rod, I think most of us would agree that is unfair. That is bad parenting. That is inappropriate discipline. However, what if the child does something wrong, so the parent sits him down and explains, this is what you did, this is why it's wrong, if you do it again, these will be the consequences. But then the child does what children always do, he does it again. And in response, the parent gives the child an ultimatum. He sends the child to the corner and says, think about what you did, if you want to keep doing it, that's your choice, but I'm warning you, I'm going to have to give you a spanking. But if you say sorry to mommy and daddy, then we will always forgive you. All of us have seen this in action, either with other parents or with our own when they were raising us. Now, unfortunately, a lot of times the child will still choose to persist in what is wrong, at which point the parent should take the child aside and give him a spanking. Now, here's the question that I would have you consider. Which one of you would object to that and say, no, you can't give him a spanking? Hopefully none of you. Because not only do we recognize that that kind of discipline is perfectly fair, but we also recognize that if we keep warning the child with our words only and withhold the rod, then that will only serve to ruin the child's behavior. Pastor Sayong, you don't even have children. Why are you spending so much time on this illustration? I hope it's self-evident. As members of the Church of Christ, we are part of God's family. And we are part of God's household. In this household, the Father's rules apply. He's told us what they are. He's given us a fair warning in part through this very passage. So then why should it be strange to us why should it be offensive to us that discipline, even severe discipline, must be administered to those who persist in sin? It shouldn't. This should not be strange. That was point number one. Paul's fair warning. And now point number two, Paul's outrage. Chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that's not tolerated even among pagans for a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. You can tell that Paul is absolutely incredulous by that one word, actually. It is actually reported. The sense is, Paul's saying, I can't believe what I'm hearing, but I'm hearing it. And the fact that Paul had to hear this from a third-party report rather than from the Corinthians themselves makes it all the more unbelievable. Paul is shocked. Paul is dismayed. Paul is outraged. Now, we have to be careful here because this can be easily missed, but here's the question for you. What exactly is Paul outraged at? What is it that he finds hard to believe? Well, this man's incestuous relationship, of course. Yes, I think that's a given, but that's actually not the right answer. That's true implicitly, but that's not the answer in terms of what the text says. Strictly speaking, this passage is not addressed to the man in question. Who is it addressed to? It is addressed to the other members in the church. In other words, Paul is just as outraged at the Corinthians' tolerance of this man's sin as he is of the sin itself. 
To phrase that differently, this passage isn't so much about incest as it is about the failure to deal with incest. And so one theologian writes, it is striking that Paul is so disturbed, not by the Corinthians' action, they've actually not done anything, but by their inaction, which he finds utterly reprehensible. In this regard, none of us here can say to ourselves, well, I would never commit incest. So I guess this passage doesn't really apply to me. Well, it's not really about that, you see. It's more about the purity of the church community and the way that all of us ought to deal with sin, whether yours or the person sitting next to you. I can guarantee you this. Whether in our church or in any other church, there is at least one person, if not many, People who are persisting, persisting in sexual immorality. I don't think I have to convince you of that. This is a rampant problem both in our society and in our churches. So that this passage is perhaps especially relevant for the modern church. And before I move on any further, this raises an important point that I think needs to be spelled out. As much as the concept of discipline and particularly excommunication are foreign to our social norms, so too is this idea of corporate solidarity, corporate guilt. Paul is not here bringing a charge against an individual. He is bringing a charge against the church, and he's bringing a charge against this church, not for something that they themselves committed, but for the ongoing and unchecked sin of one individual member. I mean, this is just inconceivable in today's culture. This idea of corporate solidarity is replete throughout this larger passage. Let me point out some details. First, Paul consistently addresses this church as a collective whole with the word you. That word appears about nine times, and every time it is written in the second person plural. So all of them are being implicated in this charge. Second, Notice in verse 4, the discipline of excommunicating this man is to be carried out when you are assembled. They can't just send one person to this man and ask him to leave quietly. His sin has become public. His sin has tainted the whole church so that his sin has to be dealt with by the whole church. Third, in verses 6 and 7, Paul uses the metaphor of leaven to describe the present situation. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. He doesn't say that you may be new lumps. He says that you may be a new lump. Paul conceives of the church as a single lump. Lastly, that the whole church shares in this man's guilt is evident in the fact that all of them are to mourn. Again, this isn't their sin. And yet they are called to mourn as if it is. There is No room for any kind of individualism in this passage. There is no room for any kind of individualism in the church. The Corinthians stand and fall together. And I will posit that part of the reason why church discipline has gone out the window in so many churches today is because we fail to recognize this preliminary point. That in Christ Jesus, we are in fact one body. We say that a lot, but it has to be put into practice. I cannot distance myself from the sins of any of my brothers and sisters, from any of your sins. We cannot, like Cain, say to God, am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes, you are. You are accountable for him as he is for you. The analogy of the family is once again helpful. If I were to commit a terrible sin, my father's attitude would not be one of apathy. He would not say, well, that's his problem, not mine. My son's an adult. I'm not responsible for him. He wouldn't say that. Rather, he would probably be overcome with shame as if he himself had committed that sin. And why is that? That's because he identifies with me. We are, after all, the same blood, As the saying goes, blood is thicker than water. 
But you see, the spirit is even thicker than blood. The only way that discipline can be effective is if this preliminary truth is a reality in our church community. If we are actually living out our lives as genuine brothers and sisters, men and women who share a common bond and therefore identify with one another. And isn't this why Paul is outraged in the first place? He identifies with this church. He considers himself to be their spiritual father, and he cares too much to stand idly by. Let's take a look at the issue itself. Still in verse 1, let me read it again for you. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. The word for sexual immorality in Greek is porneia, from which we get that term pornography. It is a broad term that covers every and any kind of unlawful sexual intercourse. So the general issue is sexual immorality. The specific issue is that a man has his father's wife. Four things to note about that phrase. First, to have someone means to have sex with that person. Second, the tense of that verb indicates that this is an ongoing sexual relationship. It's not that this man had his father's wife, but has since stopped, whether because he repented or because the relationship ended. If that were the case, Paul's approach here would be different. Notice that this man has his father's wife. What's implied is that this man is unrepentant and persisting in his sin. That is important to note because it is precisely this man's persistence that warrants excommunication. If someone repents of their sin, we don't excommunicate we celebrate. Third, the fact that the woman is described as his father's wife and not his mother indicates that this is his stepmother. Either way, if, whether it was his biological mother or his stepmother, the issue is incest. And fourth, the fact that this stepmother is not being implicated in this sin along with her stepson suggests that she is a non-believer, that she is not a member of the Corinthian church. As we will see when we get to the end of this chapter, Paul does not seek to discipline unbelievers. What have I to do with judging outsiders, he says. We do not excommunicate someone who's not even a member of our church to state the obvious church discipline is for the church. It's not for unbelievers. Now, we have to know a little bit about the social and legal background of the Corinthians to better understand this situation. First of all, what Paul says is entirely true. Incest was not tolerated even amongst the pagans. If you bear in mind what the culture of Corinth, the city of Corinth, was like, you'll realize that this speaks volumes in terms of the unusual and egregious nature of this sin. Corinth was a thoroughly, sexually perverse city, as was much of Roman society, by the way. To the southwest of the city, towering about 1,800 feet above its surrounding plain, was the Acro-Corinth, a monolithic rock, a rock hill. On top of that rock, at its highest summit, there was the Temple of Aphrodite. As most of you know, Aphrodite was the Greek goddess of love. Don't be fooled, however, by Disney's portrayal of her in Hercules. Aphrodite was more like the goddess of lust. There was nothing PG about her. And the types of lewd activities that took place in her temple would make even the most perverse man today blush in shame. When evening came, the same women who supposedly received oracles by having orgies would disperse into the city alleys where there was never a shortage of ravenous men waiting for their services. Prostitution is one of the three issues that Paul will address in this section. We will eventually get to that too. But the point I'm trying to make here is simply this. Even in a place like Corinth, where you could do just about anything without so much as being judged, 
even in Corinth, incest was off limits. For the Romans, fornication, that is sex out of wedlock, adultery, and prostitution were an accepted part of their society, but incest, incest was disgusting. Cicero, the Roman politician, once exclaimed, when mother-in-law marries son-in-law, oh, to think of the woman's sin, unbelievable, unheard of, to think that she did not quail. To quail means to show reservations. Even Cicero, a pagan, quailed at the mere thought that an incestuous woman could not quail. So then what on earth was happening in Corinth? Indeed, not only was incest frowned upon, but it was illegal. A son could not legally marry his stepmother. There is even a case in which incest was punished by deportation to a remote island. People who had incest were treated as outsiders, as disgusting people that nobody wanted to even get close to. So what's in view in our passage isn't an incestuous marriage per se, that wouldn't have been legal, but a situation in which this man is cohabiting with his stepmother. What happened to the father or the husband? Perhaps he passed away, perhaps he divorced her, we cannot say. I think that better helps you relate to the outrage behind Paul's statement when he says, and of a kind that is not tolerated, even among pagans. The fact that what was being committed was so blatantly repulsive that even the pagans could figure this out heightens the inexcusable nature of the Corinthians' guilt. And in all likelihood, it wasn't just Paul who caught wind of this scandal. The pagans of this city also knew. And as they passed by that house, or that store of someone who called himself Christian, they would say to themselves in disgust, have you heard? Those Christians are tolerating a man who has his father's wife. Do you get the picture? I wonder what kind of sins do we tolerate that makes this world scoff at our Lord and Savior? that brings shame upon Jesus' name. There is an urgency here that we cannot deny. We have to repent, not just of our sins, but of the sins of the church. And we have to restore church discipline. This is urgent. This naturally raises the question, how did it come to this? How could the Corinthians tolerate something that was so obviously intolerable? The answer is pride. Verse 2. And you are arrogant. Now at first you might think, what does arrogance have to do with this matter? Well, recall our previous discussion on arrogance. In chapter 4, Paul had pointed to the same issue of arrogance as being the root cause of their divisive factions. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? The Corinthians were puffed up. They thought themselves to be very wise, to be mature. They were especially proud of their spiritual gifts and pointed to them as evidence of their maturity, as a sign that they had made it. Their posture was the opposite of what Jesus taught, that all of us ought to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, arrogance leads to complacency, and complacency leads to spiritual laxity. And what does that have to do with discipline? Well, only everything. Because it's spiritual laxity that dulls your senses. It dampens your fervor for the law of God. It renders you lethargic so that you can't even muster up enough energy to care about the most egregious of sins. There's no better example of this than King David. All of Canaan conquered, chilling on his throne, thinking to himself, boy, is it great to be the chosen one. And in that state of arrogance, 
In that state of lethargy, his eyes wander. He sees Bathsheba. He takes her for himself. He murders her husband and covers it all up without even batting an eyelash. If God had sent Paul to David instead of the prophet Nathan, I'm quite sure I know what Paul would have said to him. Already you have all you want. Already you've become rich. Already you have become king. As the proverb says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. When you think you've made it, you become willfully blind to your shortcomings. Because if you have shortcomings, well then you haven't made it. Let me suggest that this is yet another reason why church discipline has gone out the window. The problem with the church, the problem with each one of us, is that we're under the impression that we have outgrown discipline. Certainly, we think to ourselves, I'm too old to get a spanking from my parents. And indeed, most of our parents have stopped disciplining us. But for that same reason, we think to ourselves, I'm too old to get a spanking, so to speak, from my church. We are arrogant. We have this posture of saying to the people of the church, what are you, my dad? Who are you to discipline me? But I want you to really think about this. Most of you here are not yet 30. Some of you aren't even 20. Are you really that mature that you can go the rest of your life, the rest of your 50 or 60 or even 70 years of life without ever receiving discipline again? If you're thinking to yourself, yes, then I have to throw Paul's words right back at you. I guess already you've become rich. I guess you're already a king. If you're thinking to yourself, no, I guess I do need discipline. Then the next question you have to consider is who's going to discipline you? It's not going to be your parents. They're not even physically around anymore when you become an adult, certainly not when you're married. Who's going to discipline you? It's got to be the church. Ought you not rather to mourn? That is, of course, rhetorical. Paul is saying you ought to mourn. That verb is written in the aorist tense. So to be more exact, Paul is saying you ought to have mourned. Past tense. The mourning that Paul is referring is the morning of repentance. It's like what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, for godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation. That's the morning that is in view, a godly grief over the sinfulness of sin that produces repentance and leads to salvation. As a church, we have to be a community that mourns over sin. To put that more strongly, we have to be a community that, like Paul, gets outraged by sin. Let me portray what that would look like for you in closing. When someone joins our church and starts to grow in our community, it ought to be apparent to him that we hate sin. Not just other people's sins, but our own sin. So that, if that person is living a licentious lifestyle, it should be self-evident to that person. It should naturally occur to him, I don't think I can stay here anymore. I don't belong in this community. If he comes to that conclusion on his own, because of the way that we as a community grieve over sin, and therefore he leaves the church voluntarily, that is a good thing. 
That is a good thing. Indeed, if from the beginning the Corinthians had mourned over this man's sin, we would imagine that he would have either left or ended the relationship. It is tolerance that has led to this man's sinful persistence. It is tolerance that Paul is outraged at. But I thought the church was supposed to be a safe place. It depends what you mean by that. The church should not feel so safe that its members feel as though they can blatantly sin without repercussion, that their wrongdoings will be overlooked and unchecked, and that they will still be accepted and embraced for quote-unquote who they are, sins and all. I'm sorry, but that's not a safe haven. Jesus had a phrase for such a place. He called it a den of thieves. Paul concludes our passage in verse 2 by saying, Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And finally, we reach the instruction. In the rest of chapter 5, Paul will now provide his reasons for this drastic call for excommunication, but that will have to be our focus in the weeks to come. Let's pray. O holy and righteous God, you who are perfectly just and you who are perfectly pure, you who destroy darkness and you who cannot sin, we worship you because you are holy. And we thank you that you call us to be holy because you are holy. Father, we confess that as a church, Certainly as individuals, but also as a church, we do not take sin seriously. We are not shocked by sin's egregious nature, by the rebellion that it is against you. And we do not care about the name of your son, Jesus Christ, he who purchased our salvation. We are content to let our flaws mar the name of Christ. We repent of these sins and we ask for your forgiveness. We pray that you would help us as a community be one that cherishes righteousness, that pursues after it as Jesus commands, that we hunger and thirst after righteousness in humility precisely because we are aware that we fall so short. Father, keep us humble. Protect us from pride, pride that makes us blind to our sins. Enable us to live a life that is pleasing to you Enable us to live a life that gives a strong testimony to the character of Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.